Hi everyone, my name is Kate Edwards and I'm a geographer and a culturalization consultant who's been working in the game industry for over 27 years now. And today um, I'm going to be speaking about game culturalization, which is a particular expertise of mine. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for, for uh, the invite to speak. And uh, so let's just dive into this. So let me uh, just switch over for you uh, to the slides. And uh, so here we go. So basically, you know, the worlds that we all experience and the worlds that we're familiar with in the games that we play, um, there's a lot that goes into building these worlds, obviously. Something like Skyrim, which is an incredible amount of detail, a lot of very realistic detail that goes into this game. Uh, games like Halo, which take place in our real world, but they're in the far future. So there's a lot of things that we develop that we you know, have not seen before, and yet it's still grounded in the reality of our universe. Um, Grand Theft Auto, you know, Grand Theft Auto is, is very realistic, and it often feels like it is the real place, um, you know, this recreation of Los Angeles, but it's fictional, called Los Santos, um, I find really interesting, because I'm from Los Angeles originally, and they absolutely captured the feeling of the world of LA very, very well in this game. Um, or games like Assassin's Creed, the whole series is based on real world geography and culture, and yet they have in basically superimposed a fictional narrative on top of that real world. Um, and so there's a there's interesting kind of mix of fictional and real world building going on here. And of course, games like Minecraft, Minecraft is all about world building. That's exactly what you do in Minecraft and learning resource management and how to build things and to take things down and all that. Um, but even games, you know, mobile games, which a lot of people say, well, those are just simple games. There's not a lot of world building that goes into these. That's not true. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes into building the world of, of, a, of a mobile game or of a casual game or other games like this. It's just, you may not see all of that building activity on the screen, but it certainly is there. And even things like Angry Birds, there's a whole narrative structure to na Angry Birds and this whole birds versus pigs dynamic going on. And yet in the gameplay is really basic. It's really straightforward, but there is still a lot that goes into the actual creation of this world. And so basically when we're creating these worlds, these game worlds that we, you know, that we envision as game creators, we have to see how are these worlds that we're creating and all the culture and all the other things that are in that game, how is it compatible with the local worldviews of all these markets around the world? And so that's basically the work that I do, which is I basically I look at it like a gene splicing exercise of sorts, where I'm trying to combine these two in a certain way to make sure they're compatible. Um, so that at the end we have culturalized content. So there's this zone where there's the compatibility or incompatibility of assets in the game that may make the game either a problem for the local market or it might make it a really good uh, benefit for the game in the local market. Now, why is this important? Well, because you know, global game industry revenue, this is from last year, but it's the, the proportions are still relatively the same. A lot of the revenue growth in the game industry around the world is not happening in the traditional market. So a lot of developers I meet, especially from you know, emerging markets around the world, everyone wants to sell their game in the United States or they wanna sell it in Western Europe, which is still a good goal. But the reality is that the growth, the real tremendous growth is happening more, and especially the growth of game players is happening in Asia, it's happening in the Middle East, it's happening a lot of these places where a lot of developers don't think about those as being primary markets. And so if you want your game to sell in these markets where there's tremendous growth, you have to do some extra thought about developing the game for these additional audiences and not just audiences that might have a quote Western mindset. So the other thing that's important to emphasize is that the game industry future truly is global. And I think we already know this as an industry, but I think a lot of developers I talk to don't realize that localization, you know, localized versions of games account for about 50% of the industry's global revenue. That's a lot 
of money that comes from different language versions of, of the games. Um, and what's amazing though, is that we're seeing tremendous growth, like I mentioned in non-traditional markets. So look at some of these numbers from studies that have come out in the last couple of years, you know, Nigeria, Egypt, India, Kenya, all with double digit growth. Now, most of this growth all is in mobile games, which makes sense because consoles and PCs are expensive in these markets, but still that is a tremendous amount of growth. Russia with all the problems they've had in over the years with piracy and whatnot has become the sixth largest gaming market. China in two years ago became the number one games market and also mobile revenue overtook PC gaming in China. Um, and it's going to just keep you know, moving away from PC gaming, which is a huge milestone for China because for the longest time, most of the gameplay has been on PC. So you might be wondering, what's the difference between localization and culturalization? Well, let me just explain it very briefly. So localization is basically adapting content for the local audience. I think we're all familiar with localization and a lot of it is focused on language. So the language translation of the text in the game or the voice in the game, it, it's about the language. Whereas culturalization is more about designing the actual content, the story, the environments, everything with, a, with the idea that there are other cultures that will be experiencing this game. So it's not just a language issue, it's about all the other things that are in the game that oftentimes we don't you know quote translate because they're not translatable they're not text their images their character design their environment design things like that so here's a quick example of the difference between localization and culturalization so here's a candy bar it's a kit kat candy bar which you've probably heard of kit kats um this is a strawberry candy bar and these two products are essentially the exact same product but the top one is from canada you can see it's labeled in in English and French, and the bottom one is from Japan, it's in Japanese. But so the wrapper is different, but the, the product inside is basically the same. However, in Japan, they took Kit Kat bars and they've made it a cultural phenomenon unlike anywhere else in the world. And there's a couple of reasons why this happened. One is because the term Kit Kat is very similar to a Japanese phrase, kitukatsu, which means like, I have victory, I, I'm the ultimate victor. And so it's a very positive, uplifting phrase in Japanese. So they were able to leverage that same sound, kitukatsu and Kit Kat. Um, but then they also leverage the fact that Jap Japan has a collector culture that's part of their society. So it's no surprise that like Pokemon came from Japan where you got to catch them all. And in the same idea, they, they basically have created many, many different flavors of Kit Kat bars that have even been regionalized to specific areas of Japan. You can actually get a map that shows you where to get certain kinds of Kit Kat bars around the country. Um, because it's collector culture. And so this phenomenon is basically culturalized the Kit Kat bar um, and made it a, a special thing in Japan, unlike anywhere else in the world. There's also two types of culturalization that we typically deal with. The first is reactive culturalization, which is where we're looking for things in the game that might cause a negative reaction or disrupt the user experience. And there's proactive culturalization, which is putting things in the game that's actually going to enhance the experience for local players. So for example, when I worked on Forza Motorsports, we added per language version of the game, like the Italian version, we had mostly Italian sports cars. In the German version, there was mostly German cars. And so we tailored the car selection for the language and for the region. However, you know, you could go and play any car you wanted. You would just have to get it through downloadable content. Um, and here, so here's an example of reactive culturalization. You might recognize this from the game Fallout 3. And this two-headed Brahmin bull is the whole reason why the game did not sell in India, because the Brahmin bull is sacred to the Hindu faith. And so the fact that they made this mutated radioactive animal, you know, which is sacred in India and to, and to the Hindu faith, they made this, you know, this, this kind of animal and that depiction of the Brahmin bull is really negative, um, you know, to followers of the Hindu faith. So um, the developer was not, they didn't have the time to change it. They didn't even want to try swapping it out for my poorly photoshopped two-headed horse, which would have worked just fine. But the fact they used a Brahmin bull was the reason why this game didn't sell in India. Um, and conversely, um, Marvel, when they, they partnered with an Indian uh, comic studio to create this Spider-Man version uh, uh, for India, 
And the initial reaction was very positive because people thought this is really cool that they would take such an iconic character like Spider-Man and actually culturalize him for India. However, ultimately this didn't do very well because the, what what player what not players but what readers really wanted was Peter Parker, you know, in New York City, because everyone knows who Spider-Man is. And so what they would have preferred in this case are more localized versions of Spider-Man into the many languages of India, rather than having a culturalized version of Spider-Man. So another difference between culturalization and localization is that most culturalization happens early in the process. So as the world is being created, as you're having discussions around who's in that world, what do they do, what's the player experience and all that, that's oftentimes when my work is more important because I can help the developers kind of guide them on things that might be a problem in the long term. Whereas localization typically has to wait until most of the text is completed. And so then they can actually do the translation. So that tends to happen later in the product cycle. Um, and so that's one of the major differences between the two. Now, when this work is being done, there's multiple things we have to think about. It's not just a simple matter of looking at a character and saying yes or no. Um, we have to think about the high level company values and goals. And even if you're an indie developer, this also applies to you. It's about your values and goals as a creator. So what are you willing to change for the sake of selling your game in another market? And what are you willing to not change? And that's a really important thing that we'll come back to later. Um, there's also the... Um, the context in which content is generated is also very important. So because we all have a certain bias that we carry with us and that bias often shows up in the things that we create. Also the business strategy for the particular vertical. So this applies to big companies like Sony and Microsoft, for example, because they don't make only games, they make all kinds of other things too. And so the games, games are just a portion of the overall brand for those companies. There's also a market strategy for the locale because oftentimes we have different strategies for different places around the world. We also have different strategies for the game that we're actually releasing because the games are different. And so they require to have a different strategy. And also there's always the changing geopolitical and cultural and ethical factors because as we know, especially in 2020, the world is very dynamic and things do change. And so we have to be watching constantly on how things might change in different markets around the world. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about core aspects of world building as we get into this a little bit deeper. So one of the most fundamental things you have to think about when you're building a world is the context. Is it fictional or is it real? Um, also the complexity. So how much world are you going to build? And also the intent. So basically, what's the intention of the world? And how does the narrative that you're designing for your game actually you know, reflect in the environments and everything else that you've created? And don't worry, we're going to get into this deeper. So real world and fictional world. Obviously, with most games, it's not black and white like this. There's a large zone of overlap between the two. Um, like I gave the example of Grand Theft Auto V, where it's not the real world, but it's very close to the real world. It's almost the real world, but it's, it's what I call hyper real. Um, whereas games like Skyrim is at the full other end of the spectrum because it's not in a real universe at all. It's completely fictional. It has nothing to do with our world at all. Um, and, but a lot of games are somewhere in between. And of course, there's another dimension I'm not showing here, which is not just the world part, but it's also time. Because like if you could make games in the real world, but it could be in the far future or it could be in the distant past or whatever. Um, another thing I want to make clear is that when I'm talking about realization, I'm not talking about realism. So realism being, you know, something that looks photorealistic, you know, where the game looks very, you know, like Grand Theft Auto and Skyrim examples I use, they look very realistic, um, but that's not what I'm talking about. When I use the word realization, I'm talking about how much world do you need to build in order to meet your goals. And so basically the formula for that looks like this. So you have the narrative goals for your game, whatever that narrative might be. And back to my earlier point is that even, you know, 
even games like mobile games or simple games, even a match three game has some kind of narrative that's in that, even if it's a very simple narrative, but there is a narrative. So there's the narrative goals of the world you're creating. And then there's these experience goals of what the player actually does and what you want the player to do inside your world. And so these combined basically give you the fundamental realization goals. So this helps guide you on how much world you actually need to build. And now there's some essential tools for realizing worlds that I'm gonna cover pretty quickly. We don't have a lot of time to go into all of these, but first is creating cultural evidence. And I will explain these. Uh, implying complex systems using topology, ensuring logical consistency, and selecting key thematic layers to actually build the world of your game. Um, now I'm gonna actually talk just about the last two of those for the sake of time. So, uh, but these are two of the most important ones. So logical consistency is essentially when there's logical rules that exist in the world that you've created and they're applied to everything, you know, space, time, and all the other elements in the game. Why this is important is because in our world, the world that we experience every day, there are logical systems that exist and we rely on these systems like the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun and the rising of the moon and the tides and all these other things, the cycle of the seasons, there's systems in place and systems in a world, in a game world, help ground the player in a certain sense of reality, even if the world is fictional. Um, so you have to make sure the world systems make sense for the intended narrative and you don't want there to be a conflict between the content being added to the game and the intent of that world. So let me give you an example of this. So this is a game called Cameo that I worked on and Cameo takes place in a completely fictional universe. However, you can see here on the side of the road that there were wooden crosses that were placed um, and those were supposed to be grave markers. The problem is, is that in this universe, there is no Christianity. So why would they use a wooden cross as a grave marker in this universe? So that that grave marker is, is logically inconsistent with this world. It has no place being there. And, um, you know, when I challenged the artist about it, they asked me, well, what else would I use? Well, that, that's an example of lazy creativity. Um, that's their job to actually come up with a grave marker that works for this particular universe. And so, um, so that object is not logically consistent. Um, and so we have to be looking for things like that, that we just kind of throw into the environment as we're in our full creation mode and be careful, careful about adding things that don't really belong. Um, now on the thematic layer aspect, why is this important? Well, let me step back a minute and just say that geographers like myself, we're often ideal for helping with world building because we spend all of our time deconstructing the real world around us. And so when you see a map, a piece of cartography, that map is actually the world being rebuilt into a way that is actually useful for you. And so every map you see is a world rebuilding process. In order to rebuild the world into that map, we have to understand the world. And one of the ways that we do that is we break down the world into thematic layers, like you see in this chart here, which, which we, so it helps us understand the different phenomenon out there in the world. And then we can pick and choose which things to add to our map um, based on the goal and purpose of the map, like how much, what, what the map is a certain kind of world and we are realizing that world in the map. And so we choose which things are, are going to help serve the purpose. Um, and in the geography world, we use something called a geographic information system to do this. And so you can take that same idea and apply it to your world building in great game creation to help you understand like going back to those realization goals that I mentioned earlier, you can pick and choose which layers are, are necessary. So there's all kinds of different layers that you could use to build your world. And this is these are just very high level examples here. A full list like this would, would go down to the center of the earth. Um, but there's a lot of examples here. So uh, take the first one, climatology. So building a weather system in your game, if it's necessary. So I've worked on projects where they spent a lot of time building a weather system in their game, and then it never was really used. 
it was maybe used for atmospheric effect, but it was never really, it didn't need to be that complicated or complex, but they spent so much time building it. Um, whereas if you've played Breath of the Wild, that game, if the weather system in Breath of the Wild directly impacts the gameplay and it has a role to play in the narrative and it has a role to play in the, in the experience for the player. So, so in that case, the weather system was a time well spent. So my point in bringing all of these up is the fact that I've worked on so many projects where, where they overbuild the world. They build too much because they're not thinking about back to those most fundamentals, the narrative goals and the experience goals and deciding which layers do we need to actually build the world, the most minimal world to satisfy those goals. And so you have to start with that, start with what satisfies the minimum goals. And then from there, if you actually get it done on time and everything's completed, then you can go back and start deciding what other things might you wanna to add to your world to enhance the experience. So what I wanna talk about in my remaining time are what I consider to be the five most sensitive cultural layers that I've had to deal with um, when during the world building process on many of the games that I've worked on. Um, and some of these layers are probably going to be pretty obvious to you, like history, using real world history, um, games that have any kind of faith system in them, or they use real world faith, um, the idea of inclusion and exclusion, and don't worry, I will explain all of these, um, intercultural dissonance, and what I call geopolitical imagination. So let me just go into it because I will explain this. So first, history. We have to remember that historical memory is very persistent in a lot of places around the world, especially in cultures that have a very long history, like in the Middle East, East Asia, Africa, places where cultures go back many millennia compared to somewhere like, you know, Western Europe or North America, especially North America, our history goes back only a few hundred years. Um, so that historical perspective, though, is very important. So take this example that I worked on in Age of Empires. Um, when this game came out in 1997, the original game, um, we knew at Microsoft that it was important to release this kind of game, a real-time strategy game in Korea. Well, we released this game into Korea. And what you're seeing here is a scenario where Japan in blue on the right invaded Korea, the Korean Peninsula, and they basically took over the Chosun Empire, or they almost did. Now, history tells us that this really happened. However, when this game was released in Korea, the Korean government, the Ministry of Information, said that this event never happened this way. So what are we supposed to do? Because the Korean government will not let us release this game with the scenario looking like this. And so remember that slide I mentioned earlier about the multiple considerations, things you have to think about when you make these decisions. Well, first of all, look at it from Microsoft's perspective. They're trying to grow their games business. Um, this is back when the Xbox didn't exist yet. It was still in development. So this was all, they wanted to grow their PC gaming business. And they knew that real-time strategy games from, from market research, they knew that they were very popular in Korea. And if you know anything about Korean uh, game history, a year later in 1998 is when the very first StarCraft came out. And StarCraft became, which is an RTS game, StarCraft became a national phenomenon in Korea. Um, and it still is to a certain degree. So we knew that RTS games are important for Korea. We knew that Korea is a very important gaming market. So basically we had to release this game in Korea. Uh, but in order to do that, what we had to do was create a special patch only for Korean players that showed a different version of history. So you can see here that instead of J Japan invading Korea, it's actually the Korea, the Chosun Empire, invading Japan. Um, so as you can imagine, this created a lot of debate on the development team about the nature of truth and historical truth and ethics. Is this ethical to change history for the sake of this game? And, you know, I had to point out to the developers that in a few years earlier, when I was working on Encarta Encyclopedia at Microsoft, in the encyclopedia, we had to have different facts depending on the language version of the encyclopedia, because different governments have different, you know, uh, they basically have different facts about the world, about who created what, about the height of mountains, about all kinds of things. So this has been the reality for many, many decades. It's not, it's not new, but this is when the game encountered this and basically the game had to adapt to that reality. And so history was changed for the sake of the Korean government. 
and that leads to other questions about, you know, are we serving propaganda and all these other things? And I will get into that later. Now, faith, if you have a game that has a faith system with, with inside of it, whether it's a fictional universe or whether it deals with a real universe, we have to be very careful about the issue of faith and how it's portrayed in games. For example, both of these games got in big trouble because they had a audio file that had chanting from the Quran. They had music that was lyrics from the Islamic Quran, which is something you really should not do in a game ever. So, <coughs> pardon me. So both of these games got in trouble. The game on the left actually got, got not only got banned, but eventually Microsoft globally recalled this game. And I worked on this game. Um, it was a huge issue, which I don't have time to go into all the details, but basically it was really complicated. And it was be just because somebody did not check one audio file. They did not find out what was the source of the file and what was the file's lyrics, the, the music being sung, what was it actually from? And nobody checked. And that's why both of these games got in, in trouble. Um, also using gods from you know existing religions, like in the game Smite, they use the entire pantheon of Hindu gods. And a lot of people practicing Hinduism do not appreciate this because these are gods that they worship. <coughs> so they, um, you know, it's not really, you know, they don't feel that's appropriate to have their faith system built into a game like this. Um, the other issue is inclusion and exclusion. So what I mean by this is where players will perceive that they're being treated in an inequitable way on the basis of their culture, their ethnicity, their gender, their nationality, whatever it might be. And this is a this is an area where we often get a lot of negative reactions to different games because the player sees something in the game that they feel negative reflects on who they are. So, for example, in, in Resident Evil, before this game came out, they had this pictures of this white male, you know, shooting sub-Saharan African villagers. And this is very shocking imagery, especially to people in the United States, where the, the issues of, of, you know, racial issues are very important, um, as, as we all know. And so the developer, though, they said they didn't think it was a big deal because, as you can see in the picture on the right, those villagers are actually zombies, you know, so they didn't feel that there was any problem with this. Well, this is where the, you know, and this does kind of evoke imagery that's really negative about the great white hunter and the dark continent and all these very antiquated rejected ideas, but the developer is primarily you know, based in Japan. And so J Japan is 98% ethnic Japanese. So do we expect developers in Japan to understand the racial dynamics in other countries? Well, they should have done their research. There's no excuse for not doing the research. But my point, this goes back to that earlier point about the context in which content is generated is really important. And so they just did not have the context for understanding this dynamic. And so they put the imagery in there, which they later fixed in, in, the, version, when the, in the release version of the game. This game got into trouble because of the way it portrays indigenous people on this island. You can see they have like a very antiquated appearance with a bone in their hair and sharp pointy teeth and a grass skirt. And what's worse though in this game is you actually torture these people and you kill them. And that's basically the whole point of this game. And so the developer said that this is just completely fictional. However, you can see on that island, there's an object, which is a Moai. And the Moai exists in one place on earth, which is Easter Island. So the, by using that particular cultural object, the developer actually made this a real culture on earth. And so that's why so many people were upset about it was because of that. And so that you can see in later versions of the game, they actually changed it to something else that they just kind of made up um, rather than using an actual real cultural artifact. Uh, intercultural dissonance is another category where basically two or more countries may not like each other or the cultures have friction between each other for all kinds of reasons. It could be religious regions, it could be historical reasons, all kinds of things. Um, when Age of Empires 2 came out in Korea, a lot of retailers were, did not want to put this box on their shelf because of the Japanese samurai. Now you might wonder why, why is that an issue? Well, when this came out, it was at the time when Japan and Korea were were really arguing over a disputed island in the middle of the Sea of Japan. And um, 
So every once in a while, those geopolitical disputes, they escalate and the tension between the two countries becomes very high. And so that's why the Korean retailers at the time, they didn't want to put anything related to Japan on the shelf because of this geopolitical issue going on. Um, it was temporary because, you know, maybe a year later it would have been totally fine um, because eventually those tensions did go away. Uh, even though the island is still disputed. Um, but when we released the expansion pack for Age of Empires 2, you, you can see that the box art for most of the world was the one on top there showing Montezuma in the center. But then for the Korean market, they actually made special box art only for K Korea as a way to sort of make up for the samurai mistake. So um, another thing that could be cause some kind of friction between cultures is gestures. So you can see here these characters in the in these games, Dance Central that I worked on, they're making gestures that are actually somewhat potentially offensive. Like the one he's making there on the left is almost the same. He's doing this, but it's almost the same as this, which is the same as the middle finger, you know, which is obviously a problem. Um, and then the gesture she's making on the right, which most of us would say is rock on, um, actually in, in some places in the world, that's a, that's a problematic gesture. Like in Italy, it means I'm sleeping with your wife. So, you know, gestures are very, very culturally specific. So we have to be very careful about how we use them. Uh, and then finally, this category of geopolitical imagination. What I mean by this is that governments often like to use maps to reinforce what they believe they own. So they are national sovereignty and what territory they own. There's many examples of this where maps are used as a form of propaganda. And this does, and games are not immune to this. So for example, when the, these games, Hearts of Iron were released, both of these games were banned in China. And the reason they were banned is because Tibet and Taiwan was not being shown as Chinese territory. Now you can see here that China is divided up into all kinds of territory because if you've played these games, it's basically like basically like the board game Risk, where you're trying to take over the world in different pieces. And so they divided up China, China into all these pieces, but Ch the Chinese government was upset because those two specific pieces were not being shown all together as part of China. What's really interesting though, is that these games take place in World War II, and yet the People's Republic of China does not, did not come into existence until 1949 after World War II. So the government is actually trying to reinforce the perception of what they own even before they technically even existed. Similarly, when uh, in Ninja Gaiden, you can see here in this option screen where it says country select and it has the Taiwan flag and then it says ROC which stands for Republic, Republic of China. That's the term Taiwan uses for itself, especially for the people who are ultra nationalists who want to see Taiwan become its own country. So this is a very political statement to say that ROC is a country and the Taiwan flag is being shown. So this will instantly get you banned in China because, because you're showing the Taiwan flag and because you're using the term ROC. So there's a way to fix this, as you can see, if you change country to country slash region and take the flag out because that's redundant information and use the term Taiwan instead of ROC. And so now it's you're basically showing like, is Taiwan a country or a region? That's for the user to perceive. That's their problem. You know, you put the, that perception on them rather than you as the creator actually asserting what Taiwan might be. And so that kind of distances you from this issue. Um, and this kind of thing happens all the time in cartography. A lot of my work is also outside of the game industry. So where I, like I helped Google with what we call domain tailoring. So you could, this, this area in Northern India, which is Kashmir, in India, you, you show, you have to show Kashmir's Indian territory. Um, that's a government requirement. And so you have the map on the right is actually what you will see in the India map, Google maps domain versus the rest of the world, which sees, um, which tends to see uh, Kashmir as a disputed territory, which it is. Now, finally, as I wrap up here, I just want to put make a few more important comments. So, distributing our content in the in the cloud today is is really complicated because first of all, we have instant exposure to our content, and it's and it's being seen by a broad multicultural audience all around the world. And so, once you release your game, it's out there. 
and there's no taking it back. There's no, there's no do over um, with your game content. So you have to be very careful. And one of the reasons is because we know that there's a massive online community out there who is very active and we, they're very vocal as we all know. And so if you do something that they really love, you're going to enjoy all that love and affection you're getting for your great game. But if you do something that they don't like, you know, whether it's in a specific, from a specific culture, specific country, you will hear it and you will get a lot of outpouring of hatred and anger for something that you did in your game. And so you have to be very careful about how you manage this. The other aspect that's really important is that governments and cultural institutions are fighting for what we call mindshare. So they're really concerned about which types of media are influencing their people and games are often seen as a negative force in that mindshare battle. So this is the reason why the Great Firewall of China exists because the Chinese government wants to basically protect, protect its citizens from external influence. And there's more and more countries that are sadly following that pattern where they're trying to protect people from external influences that they consider negative. So sometimes games, well, oftentimes games are seen as one of those forces that carry negative messaging, even if the game doesn't have any kind of negative impact or negative message. Um, so we have to be careful about this. Now, finally, as I wrap up here, it's really important to stress that you have the freedom of creativity. As a game creator, you are exercising your artistic self-expression in the medium of games. And so you should feel comfortable making any kind of game that you want. So you need to exercise your creative vision, but you can't expect that vision to align with the expectations in other cultures because it's not going to. Your vision will probably not be universal in every part of the world. Um, and so as we're doing the world building process, you have to be extremely conscious about your creative decisions. So make sure that you are creating with intent. Everything that's in your game should have a reason for being there and don't overbuild your game with things that don't need to be there because some of those things might be, the, might be those content assets that become a problem and they didn't need to be there in the first place. So be think really carefully about how you realize your world and what goes into it. And you know, I put this little chart here about artistic freedom and maximizing revenue. It's what I call the fulcrum of compromise, because for most of us in the game industry, we are struggling between these two, two things. We want artistic freedom. We want to make any kind of game we want to make. But at the same time, we also want to actually make money from it. And so if we want to make some money from it, then we have to be thinking about how our game is going to be interpreted by different markets around the world. If you don't care about making money, then you can make anything you want. Don't even worry about anything I've said in the rest of this talk. You can just create and make the, make the game you wanna make. But if you have any interest in, in generating revenue, then you have to think about how different markets are gonna be perceiving and accepting your game. So thank you very much. I appreciate your, your attention. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of the conference. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them my way. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.